Hi there, this is Carl Irwin with another uh, LMMS tutorial. Uh, we're going to look at uh, another synth piece, uh, and this is just an exercise that I, I went through using only the triple oscillator. So there's only triple oscillator instruments in this project. I did not use anything else. I just wanted to see what I could make of it. Uh, so I made a, a very simple um, kind of mushy-gushy pop oriented synth piece. Again, very kind of 1980s sounding with a couple of uh, cheap tricks and simple techniques. Uh, so we'll take a look at that. Won't spend a lot of time on this one uh, because we're, we're really reiterating things we've already talked about. Uh, but I did want to clear up a couple of questions that I uh, saw in some comments recently. Um, first one is concerning this version of LMMS. I've mentioned it already, but I just wanted to point out again that this is version 1.2.0 release candidate 5. So it is the current release candidate uh, of LMMS. This is the next version. This is not the stable version. However, I'm using it because I found it to be um, every bit as stable as the current stable version, uh, which I think is 1.1.3 or something like that. Um, you can get this on the website. Uh, this is Linux. I'm running this on um, uh, uh, Ubuntu variant. Uh, this in particular is Ubuntu Studio, but it's essentially just the XFCE desktop environment in Linux. Uh, and the version that I'm running here is the only one available is the app image format. So here it is. It's a standalone um, sort of uh, mobile uh, application. It, it does not install into directories uh, inside of your uh, system. It's a it's a standalone uh, sort of binary um, called app image, and that's uh, something that's kind of uh, newer to Ubuntu. They're they're starting to uh, consider this format for applications, and so far I like it. It seems pretty simple. Uh, everything is kind of packaged and enclosed together. It works pretty well. So uh, that's what we're using. Just one word of advice about. Uh, using this version if you have the other version installed particularly on Linux I found that when you open a file um, directly it will open into the installed version on your system uh, if you want to open it inside of the new version you need to open up the uh, current release candidate and then open up the file um, however, also, if you open up the old version, I found that it messes around with the graphic directories on the uh, release candidate. So when you open the release candidate, uh, the wrong graphic user interface images uh, come up and you have to reset that. So that's a little annoying. So what I did is I uh, right button selected on a document on an LMMS project file and then I set the default uh, application as being the app image file. So now whenever I open up uh, uh, applications, I don't open up in the uh, installed version on my system. I open them up in the uh, current version. I don't mess around with that that issue. Okay, So that was the first thing I wanted to address. The second uh, question I got recently was, and actually I didn't even notice it, uh, and I was thinking that there was a version of LMMS back a couple versions that had this little metronome doodad right up here. Um, but the question was, is next to the data uh, information here, the uh, beats per minute and the um, time code and, and time signatures, there is this little metronome um, icon. And it's not in the most recent stable version. And I guess that's true. Um, this is, I suppose it's new. I, again, I thought I, I thought that there was a, a metronome in there at one point. Um, I know way back in the day, if you wanted a metronome, one, one trick was to put a, uh, a click kind of pattern in a beat bass editor and then run that through your project and then you would have a click that you could turn on or off. Uh, but there is a metronome. Now, if I uh, press on this just as an example and I hit play, you can see that it's playing back a metronome pattern that follows my uh, time signature. So that's what that is. That can be very useful for uh, uh, keyboard entry so that you have some kind of click reference uh, to help you uh, you know, put your, put your music in there when you're recording. So that's what that is. It's a nice little feature that should be in any digital audio workstation. So it's nice that it's in there. Um, okay, let's take a look at this project here and see what we have going on. Then I'll talk a little bit about the uh, sounds and what's going on with these uh, instruments over here and just how I use them.
Okay, so um, just a couple things here. Uh, first of all, what you're listening to, and I don't do this every time, um, but what you're listening to actually on the track is not uh, the live output uh, from this project file. You're actually going to be listening to a final uh, rendered um, a mastered version of it. Uh, and that, that that's a good point to bring up, that um, it whatever you create in your workstation is not going to be and this is for any of them for, for proprietary ones uh, the professional ones or, or these uh, free freebie open source ones uh, whatever you render out is not really the end of your work um, you you want to go back and take that file and put it into an audio editor a dedicated audio editor uh, or back into your workstation although um, you can do some mastering maybe that's something we'll look at sometime in LMMS uh, you can remaster uh, what you what you've made to uh, uh, kind of tweak the EQ and, and some of the settings there um, but but you want to remaster it or you want to uh, uh, get the exact tone uh, right in your final output uh, after you've rendered it once. So this has already been run through an audio editor and has been um, uh, tweaked a bit, and that's what you're listening to. Uh, I don't usually do that, but I did it on this one because there's a few changes I made to the volume envelopes um, in general to the track. Uh, so a few things here uh, to go through. First of all, again, this is all uh, triple oscillators. So even the percussive sounds up here, uh, these kind of drum sounds, is the triple oscillators. Uh, and in the last tutorial, we looked a little bit about that idea. You can see I just kind of piled up these very close intervals and low registers uh, in come up with this uh, kind of drum sort of sound by stacking things up. So uh, that's a nice little trick to use uh, when you're using just waveforms to generate uh, percussion sounds. Um, I used uh, to begin with presets. That's what I did. And again, you can find your presets over here uh, under the triple oscillators. There's a, not as many presets as what you have for Zened sub effects, but there's a few uh, to work with, a, a few diverse ones. There's not, not that many diverse ones, but a few. Um, and I started with those, and then what I did is I tweaked them either using uh, additional filters in the output chain. So if we look into, uh, for exa example, this one here. Uh, if you look in the effects chain, you know, I added a reverb to that to give it uh, kind of more of an ethereal sort of uh, fall off to it. Um, and then I also played around with the envelopes a little bit. So you can go in and, and tweak the envelopes, but I did not change the sounds themselves. So I didn't mess around with uh, whatever, you know, uh, modulators are being used, wave wave modulations are being used uh, on the the uh, sounds. I, I pretty much stuck to, this doesn't really have anything on it, no arpeggiations or anything like that. Um, but I did use um, uh, the filters quite a bit. So particularly on some of those sounds that were a little bit more percussive and I wanted to turn them into more of a pad, sort of a gradual enveloped increase, I did that here. Uh, so I did tweak the sounds in that way, in the effects chains and then on the envelopes. Um, but in general, these are just uh, you know presets that are available to you uh, right right off the bat. Again, diverse enough to work with. Um, so some percussive sounds. Uh, all of these are uh, uh, triple oscillators. Uh, automation, real quick. Uh, I went again with this uh, idea to use the beat baseline editor for uh, automation. Now, there is a controller rack that you can use waveforms uh, for repeating oscillations uh, in, your, um, uh, in your controller, uh, uh, your uh, button and, and fader and knob controller capabilities. Rather than using the controller rack, which uh, is, is binds you to a waveform and trying to figure out what the uh, um, frequency of that waveform is going to be in a little bit of trial and error there. I use the automation uh, so I can just put some pinpoint pinpoints in here to say I want this uh, oscillation to happen uh, tw you know one full cycle within a measure and then it starts over 
again. Uh, so I used uh, the uh, Beat Baseline Editor to do that uh, when I needed it. Another thing I did is that I used the, uh, I tried to show this to you in real time, but I uh, would assign an instrument to the effects miser, mixer and then apply that automation to the fader. Now what that allows me to do is it allows me to then later on change the volume, the overall volume of the instrument if I wanted it to be a little bit louder, quieter. I believe in the last tutorial I applied my automation to the volume uh, knob, which you can do, and it, it, it essentially will accomplish the same thing. Um, although I, I'm not sure, I think the volume on these might actually affect velocity. So if you're using sound fonts that have multiple velocity settings, uh, it's questionable as to whether or not the uh, volume uh, change actually affects what velocity is being used, whereas the fader would not. Um, but I use the faders here to give myself a little bit more flexibility. So you have a couple of different points in the output at which you can apply uh, automation. So you can see that going on there. And then wherever you apply the beat baseline, wherever that's occurring, Occurring, it will apply that automation then. So you can see right here if I uh, solo this track uh, and play right from here. Also one other thing, you can see there's automation going on right before the sound. Uh, I did this because one fault that um, it's not really a fault, it's just a, a truth that you deal with in automation is that wherever your last your last automation point was at, at the last playback, that's where you start. Uh, whenever you play back again. So what I did is I took uh, a copy of the automation and put it right before the note so that it would leave me off where I want to be. It leaves me off right at uh, the, the baseline that I want it to be at uh, before the notes actuate over here. So that's just good practice. You can see anywhere I do automation, I tell it one measure ahead uh, where I want the volume to begin at so that it's not actuating right away on that downbeat. Sometimes those things don't pick up. Um, so anyway, if I play this back, you can see in this measure right here, let me um, blow this up a bit. In this measure right here, when all of the notes sound, uh, there's no automation, and then it begins after they've all sounded on the next measure, and you can see what this sounds like. Uh, bump ahead a bit more. So right now it's picking up that data on the fader to set it at the right amount, and then they'll uh, sound. Now you can see one problem here is that we're at 30 beats per minute, and this is the case in point, that the last automation that I had in here that changed the tempo, I have an automation track down here, if I unsolo this, that is dedicated only to tempo changes, and the very last tempo that we had when we played the file was at 30 beats per minute, which is well under. So if I quickly start back here, you can see that it puts me back to 80 where I'm at, and we'll try this again. you can see the fader jumping up and down and it gives you that kind of a vibraphone sort of sound to it this kind of wah 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 sort of sound so this can be accomplished uh, using volume faders or volume knobs uh, the effect can also be uh, created using um, uh, some kind of a filter sweep where you're filtering high to low frequency, some kind of high pass, low pass trade-off. You can do that too. That's a little bit more complicated. It's a lot easier to just use volume for, for an effect like that. Uh, so that's one way that we can use automation. Another uh, form of automation is to just place an automation track directly in here rather than in the beat baseline editor. And then you can automate a, a crossfade. So here I've got um, on this whole tone scale figure going on up here, if I solo these tracks, so we'll get the instruments plus their automation. Uh, there's going to be a crossfade between this sound and these sounds down here. And again, this is applied on the um, mixer, the effects mixer. So we'll jump back here to the measure before, hit play. You can hear at the start we have the top one playing, and that one's fading out as the lower sounds are fading in. And uh, the effect uh, that that 
again comes off as it, it that sounds a bit like a uh, a filter pass some kind of a high pass low pass filter crossfade um, it isn't it's just actually different instruments uh, one has uh, uh, fewer high frequencies and the other one has many more uh, and they trade off and it just makes kind of an interesting sound also uh, in terms of the MIDI entry one of these instruments uh, the organ sound down here is an inversion of the uh, whole tone scale figure that's going on up here. So uh, the figure itself gets inverted as it crossfades uh, in and out uh, to the next uh, next few measures. Um, some other things that are going on in here, I use the uh, beat baseline automation track down here again. Um, another thing I did was that for some of these sounds, as I said before, in order to make them sound more pad-like, uh, I would change the envelope. And you can see this has a very slow attack to it. So when I strike this uh, uh, instrument, it has more of a gradual um, uh, actuation, and it makes it more more pad-like. Uh, very suiting, you know, suitable to this kind of music here, where we're dealing more in textures than we are in melodies. There's really no melody going on in here. Um, if I isolate this, you can hear what it sounds like. You'll also note if I pull this out that uh, I'm overlapping the data by a measure. Because uh, it has a very slow actuation, uh, I have the sounds actually merging and meshing with each other. So we're coming off of one set of notes for one chord, and they kind of meld into the next one, not in any particular time, not exactly on the measure, uh, but a little bit ahead. So it sounds kind of like this. Turn on the automation. If we look back here, we can see that fader jumping. Okay, so that's that. Uh, automation tracks uh, covered there. Uh, beat bass uh, um, automation tracks for the tempo. So very quickly, just let me show you what's going on here. LMMS is great in that anything that has a knob or a switch, for the most part, there's a few exceptions, Anything that is a knob or switch can be applied to an automation uh, track. Uh, and this is very useful. Uh, you can do global automation or you can assign to a track. I find that it's better to assign to a track because you can much more easily find where you're at visibly uh, in your song. Um, but for example, if I wanted to change the automation on the tempo up here, I could right button click and then hit edit uh, song global automation. And this gives me from measure one all the way to the end of my piece. Now, it doesn't allow you to go beyond a certain amount until you enter data here and then it will give you some more to work on. So I find that Editing global automation is not very uh, is not a very useful way of doing it. Um, it's better to uh, control, click, and then drag and drop onto an automation track to assign uh, where you want that to go. So again, you control, you click and hold, and then drag it to your automation track, and then you can open up that track data, and then you can assign points that will affect that number. Um, I find that to be the much better way to do it. It makes it a little bit more logical, a little bit more easy to see. Now, if you are importing a MIDI file, uh, this is a question that's come up in the past. If you import a MIDI file that, say, you, somebody else created, maybe you're collaborating with somebody, or it's a MIDI file that you created in a, in a notation program, which is something maybe we'll look at in the future, writing something inside of a notation program and then exporting that MIDI data and bring it in, bringing it in here uh, to create a mock-up. You will find that there is automation automatically applied to these different parameters if you have that automation created in the uh, notation program. So if I have a tempo change in my uh, music file and then I export that MIDI data, I'm going to find that I have that automation data already in here. Now, you may not like the way it works, so you may want to edit it. And the, the, the crummy thing about that is that it's going to be applied to the global automation. So what I find 
find is that I usually redo that. I uh, right button click on my uh, um, item that I want to change, and then I'll click on Remove Song Global Automation. It will erase everything. And then what I'll do is using my notation file as a reference, I'll go in and then I will reapply that automation to an automation track. Sometimes, uh, if it if it's a little bit wonky and it doesn't quite work out right, I'll do it that way. Um, otherwise, if you're collaborating with someone and there's say uh, global automation that changes the uh, sound of the instrument that you're using. Let's say you're using a sound font and uh, the bank of that sound changes uh, or you can't assign a new sound font because it's already got a predetermined bank and patch set in it from your MIDI file. You would want to go into that uh, instrument, select on your bank and uh, a patch, right button click and then delete uh, all of the global automation so that you can then set your own uh, banks and patches and set your own automation. So you might find that those kinds of things happen. The same thing can happen usually in MIDI files with volume as well. So uh, you want to again right button click on the volume in the pan and these different things to delete the global song automation and then apply your own as you see fit. Um, so anyway, that's automation in a nutshell, uh, the way I used it here. So yeah, this is what we came up with, and a lot of really interesting sounds in there, able to make a number of different pad sounds by tweaking the filters and uh, you know extending out that uh, attack and holding out the sustain and the release filter. Uh, the more you want the envelope to apply, the greater you want this to be. You increase the amount, and then it will uh, kind of uh, apply it in a, a variable amount based on how high this knob is. Um, so that's, uh, that's filters uh, on these um, different sounds and the neat thing is that on the triple oscillator you can use filters. On the Zined sub effects you cannot use filters. Uh, the filters are are built into the Zen Add Sub Effects interface. So if you want to change a, a, an envelope filter, uh, or rather the envelope, I'm, I've been saying filter, but I mean envelope. If you want to change the envelope, you have to go into uh, the Zen Add Sub Effects graphic user interface and then change it there. Um, whereas that is, I suppose, a benefit of using the triple oscillators is that you know it's it's pretty simple and straightforward. It's uh, three oscillators. You set the waveforms. You can come up with interesting sounds, and you have total control. Uh, right from the uh, LMMS uh, user interface right here without having to go into another layer of uh, uh, GUI. Um, so anyway, there we go. Another um, another synth project. Uh, compositionally speaking, it's pretty straightforward. Again, I talked about uh, the whole tone scale usage over here, uh, a repeating... Uh, uh, three or four chord pattern over here using a very standard uh, kind of progression. Uh, and then down here at the very end, there's a bit more of a dramatic release using a very, very pop-oriented uh, descending bass uh, diatonic progression. Not a lot of chromaticism going on in there. So, um, yeah, pretty straightforward, cheap tricks going on there. And, uh, you know, all using one one uh, instrument, just the triple oscillators in LMMS. Very, very, very powerful. Um, you know, I, again, I, I see no real need to use a lot of VSTs, even though you can use VSTs, 32-bit uh, VSTs, uh, Windows format VSTs in LMMS. I, I just don't see the point. Uh, you can really emulate any kind of sound you want. You have total freedom uh, with this particular instrument to create anything you want. Um, downfalls to the uh, triple oscillator I talked about in the last tutorial. One big problem with it is I find that by default the volume is incredibly potent um, and the waveforms interact um, kind of destructively right off the bat. Uh, they clip very, very easily, very quickly. So uh, you'll note that as you look at these, you can see how low I have the volume set. Uh, and they, th there is no gain setting in general, besides this volume setting here, um, not like on the sound font uh, instrument, you can change the gain for your instruments uh, as a layer underneath the volume. Um, you can control the volume down here on, on each oscillator, but in general, you just want to give yourself a lot of headroom. If you're going to create a sound from scratch, you want to start low on everything and then work your way up. Otherwise, you run into this problem where you're, you're having to turn the volume back uh, or then you know use the faders and have them pulled back. In general, in your mix output, I find that you want to have a ton of headroom up here so that you can clarify your general uh, volume envelopes, again, in a, a, a wave editor outside. 
Um, and you want to have your master volume pretty low, and you want to have your effects channels essentially below the midpoint uh, and get an output that has a lot of space up here so that you can uh, work with it later on. So anyway, just a few more tips and a couple things that we covered that we haven't talked about up to this point. Uh, hopefully the next tutorial won't be dealing so much with synths, but I did want to address uh, some of the synthesizers, particularly these two real biggies uh, that you have in LMMS, the uh, Zenad sub effects, really powerful with lots of great presets, and then the triple oscillator, which really lets you make any sound that you want uh, if you uh, take the time to uh, use it and build something from scratch. So anyway, there you go. Uh, automation, triple oscillators, what more can you ask for? Uh, so good luck with uh, this information and I hope it helps you in your projects and uh, I wish you all happy mixing.